Hey everyone, thanks again for tuning in to Seeker Plus. I am Trace. This is episode two of three in our series on matter. That's right, episode two of three. If you haven't watched last week's episode about the beginnings of matter, make sure you get there, then come back and watch this one. We just went deep into what matter is made of in the last episode of this series. My brain kind of still hurts about it, but this helps us understand what's coming next in this episode. This is going to get confusing, so make sure that you pay attention. So today we're going to talk about the basic states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, but we're also going to talk about the other three that you may have never heard of. One of those takes up 99% of all the matter in the universe. No big deal. You probably don't talk about it that often. So anyway, let's talk about matter. Let's kick into it. Solid, liquid, and gas. Those are the states of matter that you learned about in elementary school, right? That's like half the states of matter that exist. It's not even close. So your elementary school was not entirely accurate. There are six different phases or states of matter. We've got two condensates, then we have solid liquid gas, then we have plasma. So states, they are physical. In a solid, the atoms are allegedly hooked up and ordered into a structure, like a lattice, for example. When you think of a solid, it's really easy. It's a table, it's steel, it's rocks, it's ice, it's crystals. Uh, they have low kinetic energy. The atoms aren't moving that much. They're fairly stationary. And when you apply force to a solid, it's going to react in a very specific way. You can have shearing forces or forces that kind of cut across. You can have perpendicular forces or forces that kind of push down on a thing if it's flat against the ground. You can also have parallel forces. And all of these will be resisted by the solid uh, depending on its atomic structure. For example, sandstone is pretty weak, so you can have shearing forces that rub off all sorts of chunks of it, but it still holds up if you were to punch it, right? Different forces do different things. But a solid, I think, we can really grasp in our minds because we see them all the time. They have to do with the bonds of the atoms and molecules inside of the solid. The stronger the bond, the harder the solid can be. On top of that, how those atoms are arranged within the solid will give it different properties. For example, metallic solids, which I think you probably know what that is, metal, that's rigid metals, it's got good thermal and electrical conductivity, you know these already. There's also ionic solids, those are ion-based lattices, they're held together by charges. You actually are pretty familiar with one of these, table salt, NaCl, the sodium is positive, the chlorine is negative, so they're being held together by their charge. Then there's covalent crystals, which are strong but brittle lattices. You may not know what this is uh, based on its scientific name, but you've definitely seen one before, because diamond is covalent lattices. Basically, it's all carbon, it's super strong because of the electrons that are being shared, the covalence of the electrons. But there's no springiness in something that's this solid. Solids that are covalent, like a diamond, is so hard, and it's got so much strength and rigidity it becomes very brittle, unlike some other solids that maybe are less hooked up. There's also a solid type called molecular crystals. They're weaker lattices, and they're usually organic or gases that have been made solid, uh, which is a thing that really happens if you think of dry ice. That is solid carbon dioxide. Um, it just sublimates or goes right from a solid to a gas. That's why it has all that fog coming off of it, and also why you're not supposed to use it in enclosed spaces. Um, theoretically, Anything can be a solid. That's what I read while I was doing the research for this episode. I didn't know that. But think about this. In 2016, two scientists, Diaz and Silvera, published a material science paper about hydrogen that was made solid. Metallic hydrogen. And that messed up? They had to put it under 495 gigapascals. That's 50,000 kilograms per square millimeter. It's very, very high pressure. Yikes. And in case you're wondering, because I'm sure you are because you're listening to Seeker Plus, hydrogen is a black reflective metal when it becomes a solid. Is that not awesome? So if you add energy to a solid, then you start to loosen those atoms up. They get more kinetic energy and they start moving around and then you get a liquid. The liquids have some kinetic energy, kind of a messy structure, but a constant volume and a high density. It conforms to containers of a fairly constant pressure, and it's usually non-compressible because the atoms are still pretty close together. Funnily enough, liquids are not that easy to understand. It's really 
a middle ground between the solid and the gas, which we're about to talk about. But you know a liquid when you see it. Obviously, we're surrounded by oceans and lakes and rain. All of those are liquids. But if you heat or cool those things, they become something else. They're either a solid or a gas. So these liquids are, are very strange because they're in this middle ground, like a medium state. We can measure a lot of these things when it comes to liquids, though. There's whole branches of science that all they want to do is understand fluid motion, fluid dynamics. There's something in liquids called the vapor pressure curve. It's a point where temperature, pressure, and its volume are all connected. And it's a line on a graph. But the line doesn't extend all the way across the graph, only partway. If you graph temperature and pressure and test liquids all around that graph, if they hit that line, that's called the critical point. And then it will suddenly become a vapor. But you can also play all the way around that line, never touching it, and keep something in its liquid or vapor form. But if you're already having trouble with fluids, let's just go a little deeper and then we'll move on. Uh, in 1984, a guy named Dan Schechtman created something called a quasi-crystal. At the atomic level, it's non-ordered. It has no lattice and no structure. So that sounds like a liquid. But at the macro level, it looks and behaves like a solid. Isn't that weird? Again, whole branches of science studying fluids because they can do some really weird stuff. Dan got a chemistry Nobel for that discovery because it changed the nature of how we understood solids. Cool, right? Anyway, liquids are still weird, but let's move on. Add a little more energy to this equation, and you get gases. Gases have no order to their particles. They have high kinetic energy. They have no ionization. There's no definite size or shape to something that is a gas. This lets them spread forever. No box, out of here. In a box, I will fill every single bit of that box. Gases are super neat because if you make the box smaller, the gas is going to push back on the box. That's really interesting. Why does it do that? For some reason in my head, gases are real sassy. It's like, you make my box smaller, I will push you. That's what they do. Anyway, atoms and molecules are distributed randomly in a gas. They knock into each other, and they spread out, and then they knock into each other again. And they're doing this a lot. The atoms of a gas are impacting each other so often that when you push on something that's like a balloon filled with gas, that pressure feels constant to us. But it's really all of the little atoms hitting each other and bouncing back all the time. Gas molecule speed, by the way, is measurable. We know how fast all of those little gas molecules are moving because of the speed of sound. If you break the sound barrier, what you're really doing is exceeding the speed of the gas molecules that are around you. They can't pass that pressure information on to the next random connection that they're going to hit with the next gas molecule, right? This is why the speed of sound is lower at a high temperature or at a low pressure because there's fewer gas molecules that you have to exceed the speed of. Isn't that cool? Yeah, I thought so too. Because of all of these properties, gases have huge amounts of stored energy. That's why we can compress them into a tank and have compressed air that powers all sorts of machinery. And you can also have properties of atoms and gases that make them very useful, like helium which is a noble gas. It doesn't react to things. When you super cool helium, it can be used in all sorts of scientific pursuits. For example, keeping the magnets of the Large Hadron Collider cold, and also surrounding them with something that, if something does go wrong, it won't explode, because helium doesn't react. You can also do things like gasoline vapor that is explosive and can move around and fill a space really easily. So you vaporize the gasoline into a cylinder, then it explodes with lots of energy pushing the piston down and you get an engine. So now that we've done solids, liquids, and gases, what comes next? You add a little more energy to a gas and you get this like super gas called a plasma. Think of it like putting electricity into the air, a lot of it. The molecules of a plasma have to ionize. They lose their electrons. It's a state of matter number four. And plasma is high, high energy, an equal mix of electrons and photons. And it's kind of like they're too hype to pair up. The electrons are there. The protons are there. They're having a great time in this club. Everyone's super hot. But they're having an equally amazing time being separate. So they're not going to pair off and try and leave, you know? So the examples of a plasma are things like the sun, fire, aurora, lightning. 
Uh, the sun is a really good example. It's not a massive incandescent gas like Seeker Pals. They might be giants would say, but it's actually a miasma of incandescent plasma. Just saying, a uh, good update on their end. But anyway, plasma is all over the universe. It's seen literally everywhere. Basically, any visible matter could become a plasma if you add energy to it. 99% of the visible universe is plasma. The properties of a plasma are it's electrically reactive. So if you think of a liquid and a gas as related, plasma is like their cousin. It reacts to electromagnetism because all of the little bits of the hot gas are charged. And it behaves kind of like a fluid. If you watch videos uh, that NASA takes of the sun, you see filaments flying off all the time. That's all plasmas. If it's de-energized at any point, it kind of falls back into being a gas. And all the little electrons and protons pair back up and become a gas again. Neon lights are a cool example of a plasma in action that you can see around you. Neon is also a noble gas in that same column as helium. And inside that tube, electricity is run through the gas, exciting it and turning it into a plasma in a controlled environment. It ionizes it, which gives off light. The red neon is actually the color of neon gas when it becomes a plasma. Isn't that cool? If you were to do it with argon, that's how you get blue neon lights. It's actually argon. If you want a pink sign, you use a red neon with a blue coating, and then you get pink. You know, stuff like that. It's kind of fun. So I know I said that there were six states of matter, and we haven't hit the last two, and we've done a lot of stuff so far. Uh, let me try and condense these. That's a joke, because these are both condensates. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to break your brain in the beginning. So what you really do is you take a solid and you cool it down a lot more. You can also do this with liquids. Condensates are very special kinds of matter. You would take rubidium gas, for example, cool it with lasers, and then you get a Bose-Einstein condensate. There's also the fermionic condensate. These are super low energy. The Bose-Einstein condensate, or BEC, was theorized in the 1920s by theoretical Bayes, Satyendra Bose, and Al Einstein, probably heard of them. Uh, but it was actually first created in the mid-90s. And it's near absolute zero. So all of those atoms have such low energy that they start to behave as if they're a single thing, a single giant atom. Isn't that cool? They call it a quantum mechanical entity because you can see quantum mechanics on a macro scale. You can actually see them under a microscope. The condensation, if you read the actual paper, was first achieved at 10.54 AM. Isn't that nice? Right after breakfast, before lunch, making a Bose-Einstein condensate. So weird. Nice job, kids. Anyway. Another thing that condensates have is superfluidity. Basically, it's a perfect fluid, follows all the rules, no viscosity, no friction, conducts electricity perfectly, can be used to trap and stop light itself. So cool. Condensates are really weird. They stopped light cold. Finally, there's the fermionic condensate, which I briefly mentioned. NASA has a few papers that call this the sixth state of matter. Some people say there are only five. You can debate about it. Um, but it's also cold. Instead of social bosons that produce the Bose-Einstein condensate, these are more antisocial fermions. We're going to talk more about uh, these superfluids and superconductors and these more exotic states of matter next week, because if you take these superfluids and you take these superconducting condensates and we learn about how to use them, we could potentially create things like levitating trains and ultra-fast computers. Basically, the future rests in understanding more about these exotic states of matter. Those are the six states of matter, but there are so many more than six. We are just getting started. Whatever third grade teacher you had who told you there were only three states of matter, solid, liquids, and gases, you should call them up and be like, whoa, what did you do? You could have told me so much more. Right? Come on. Or you text them if you want. I don't know. Do you text your teacher Facebook message? I don't know. Send them a high five emoji or whatever emoji you pretend is a high five because there isn't actually a high five emoji. We can stop light in a condensate, but we can't make a high five emoji? I think that one should replace going to the moon because it's happened more recently. Like, we can go to the moon, but we can't. We can create a Bose Einstein condensate, but maybe that one's not going to catch on. Anyway, matter is crazy. We're going to categorize it. We're going to taxonomize it. We're going to break it down and figure out exactly how all of these little things work. And it's going to be super interesting. And to end the episode, I'd like to have a quote from Seeker Bay, Neil deGrasse Tyson The universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. And to be honest, after writing all these episodes, I totally get that. 
Thanks so much for tuning in to Seeker Plus this week. Uh, I'm Trace again. Make sure you follow us over on Twitter. You can find us at Seeker or me at Trace Dominguez. Check out all the other episodes here on Seeker. You can subscribe to us and get all of those throughout the week. We'll be back next week with our conclusion to the Matter episodes. Thanks for watching. 